If you've been struggling with putting together or taking your genius and turning it into an offer that your ideal buyer would buy from you at exactly the price that you want, that's exactly what we're going to be talking about today with the legendary Chris Doe. Stick around for it. Now, this is video number four out of a five part series discussing the five core essentials for you to grow your creative freelance business. If you haven't watched those three, I'll give you a very small summary. The first one we talked about was buying psychology. The second one was sales psychology. And the third one was pricing psychology. If you missed those, you're probably going to see a link here for it. And there'll definitely be links in the description for the other ones because they kind of flow into one another. Now, for this fourth episode, we're talking about crafting an irresistible offer. So Chris, let's jump right into it. When you say an irresistible offer, what exactly does that mean? And what do you mean by that? An irresistible offer is an offer so good that it compels the person to say yes, which requires you not to pitch or convince or to do much sales. And what you want to do is understand what motivates people and give that to them. So you're removing resistance. The thing that gets in the way of a sale is when people feel tension around making the decision to move forward. And there's lots of ways to do this, but I want to share a little nugget from my former business mentor, Kier McLaren, God rest his soul, is that he's like, Doing good work is the price of entry to be in business. So what you have to do is take that off the table. A lot of us think, well, the work should sell itself. And what we don't understand is that as competition has increased and there are so many talented people in the world vying for the same kind of work that we're trying to get, we can no longer rest on the product is good. The product being the design services that you do, the copywriting or the websites that you build. Because if you're not good and the work isn't good, they don't even consider you in the first place. So now what we have to do is we have to enter a new level of thinking about our products or services in ways that they become so attractive that that expression, take my money, comes from the client. Not literally, but they feel that. I'm curious about this because this is so timely. I had a conversation with some of my students and we were talking about copywriting and particularly writing hooks and how they're concerned that maybe they're sensationalizing the information that they're going to give in their videos. Aside from, you know, competition going up, talent going up, some people may be feeling like, but I'm really good. Why don't people just buy from me? Is there something to the idea of why do I have to like make it sound sexy or come across sexy or really sell it if people just want good work. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, and I would agree with them actually. You should not fluff it up and fluff it up is the wrong concept. You're not trying to put a nice package around a crap product. When you talk about creating an irresistible offer, it means you've actually redesigned, re-engineered the product itself so that it doesn't really matter what the wrapper is. So we have to think about this radically different from the point of view of our client. And what we have to do is we have to try to identify what are the top things that create tension in the buy-sell cycle. So let's talk about that, Mo. There's a couple of things, right? Why would a client not buy? Well, they feel tension around something. Oftentimes, it's around price because they think it's too little or it's too much. And it's kind of like the Goldilocks syndrome, right? Where it has to be just the right price. It's not too hot, not too cold, not too firm, and not too soft. And the natural reaction is, well, an irresistible offer is one that then must be at the lowest price. Well, sometimes that's the case. So when a client experiences a tension around price, what are ways to alleviate that tension? Well, there's two ways that I can think of. Reduce the price to a point in which it becomes a no-brainer decision for them. Or increase the perceived value, which is really where I'd like to spend most of our conversation today. Because anybody can tell you to reduce your price to sell more. Few people can teach you how to raise your prices so you can sell less to more qualified buyers. For what reason? Let's talk about the reasons first, the whys behind us. So people will automatically have this knee-jerk reaction when I tell them, raise your prices if you want better clients. So like, what do you mean? Are we trying to just build clients out of money? Are we being greedy capitalists, as some people will say? Well, no, let's, let's talk about this. So here's a simple exercise that we're going to probably be doing the workshop together if we wind up seeing one another, which is we're going to make a list. What are the benefits and consequences of raising your prices? And then what are the benefits and consequences of lowering your price? And what we want to do is attack both of these lists from an unbiased, objective point of view. So Mo, let's try and do this exercise. What are the benefits and consequences? So both the pros and the cons of raising price. Let's start with the positive. What might happen if you're able to raise your price? Just throw out whatever comes to the top of your mind. Higher caliber client. If the price is higher, then that means that business is probably making more money and the perceived value of my 
product is higher because it's more expensive compared to other people in the space. There's a accountability on me as a service, the team as a service to deliver good value, quality value. So we hold ourselves to a significantly higher standard. Well, that's pretty good. Let me ask you a couple of questions. And sure. I want those of you that are listening or watching this to play along. Hopefully I've given you enough time. If you haven't hit pause, write down some of your answers and come back to us and then we can compare notes. It's kind of a way of <laughs> having like almost an instructional video for you here, okay? So if I gave you more money to do the same work that you're doing, how might you spend that money? Well, the customer experience, like making sure that from beginning to end, the feeling of the service is quality. The team would be of higher caliber, higher talent. I'd get A player teams to then offload the work off me and then for them to take accountability. You know, I'm in the creative business, so this may not apply to everybody, but the higher the talent, the more innovative the end product is going to be when we're thinking about things like editing or filming or even script writing. So I feel like it just, everything just goes up <laughs> with, for quality and the experience of the service itself. That's what comes to mind for me. I'm gonna make this kind of um, almost pedantic or very super pragmatic so that you don't feel like we're being hyperbolic and exaggerating, pumping up the benefits. So I'll speak in real basic terms here. If you gave me more money to do the project, it would mean that I could focus more on you. Mm. I'm not worried about taking on a bunch of clients because I have bills to pay. That seems pretty logical, right? Mm. So all of a sudden I can focus on a few and if I can focus on a few logic would then lead me to the point in which I could deliver better product. And instead of cutting corners, I can think of new creative ways to improve product or service, customer experience or something like that. And these are important things to me. If you paid me more, I could probably not only just focus on you, but I can actually work on this longer. Back when I ran a production company where we make commercials and music videos, we got paid a lot of money. On average, I think any job that would come in the door would be about a quarter of a million dollars, two hundred. 50,000 US dollars. On the highest end, we, we did a project for over a million. And on the lower end, we probably did a music video for like 40K. So it's a broad spectrum. I'm not trying to throw that out there to flex on anybody. I'm just showing you this whole spectrum. But when they get into the three, four, five hundred thousand dollar range, it means there's enough room in the budget for us to hire just about anybody. Mm. And I've used this before where as a way to close the job, I said, you know, this effect that we're trying to achieve, I have the person who worked on that, on the feature film that you're referencing. <sighs> I have that artist on tap and we've worked with them or her before and they're gonna do an amazing job. Imagine like how that would make you feel. We talked a little bit about this in the buyer psychology, which is we buy things because it gives a sense of status. Imagine if you could tell your coworkers, we hired the team who hired Roger Deakins, the cinematographer mm. who shot XYZ movie. They worked on our spot. I mean, imagine if you had not just a players, but world-class, best of breed, all-stars working on your team. Yes. And what would that do for us? Well, if you have the best people, you have a higher chance of doing the best work. <laughs> right. Not always. We know right. this. Right. You don't always get a We Are The World song with the best artist. Sometimes you get a piece of crap song. And if we look long-term now, not only did you make your client look really good and proud that they made this decision to hire you, they get to tell all their friends they worked with the best people in the world, which gives them status. But also it means that the next time you go out to get a piece of new business, you can use this as a shining example of what you're capable of doing, the potential of your creative output. And that's worth a lot. But let's say you spend none of the money on trying to improve anything. And that's your right and your prerogative too. Let's just say you're really dialed in with the team that you have and they're creative ninjas. Well, what happens is now is you're more profitable. What can you do with this profit? You can upgrade the equipment for your team. You can invest in systems and software and consulting and coaching and personal development because you have extra runway. It means you can breathe a little easier. So when a poor fit walks in the door, you don't have to take them. You don't like their vibe. You don't like what they stand for. And you have greater power to say no. You can be more discriminatory as who you choose to share your gifts with. These are good things. And that, you know, that end of the year bonus or the half year bonus that you may or may not want to give, you can be more generous and reward the people who are there for you with you this entire journey. Or, you know, that dream vacation that you had to delay for seven years because you've been working like a dog. You can finally say to your partner, to your loved one, say, you know what? Here's where we're going to go. It's the dream place. And we're going to check out for two weeks because we can afford it. So the quality of life goes up. These are just some of the things that come with the benefit of charging more. Hey, wait, I want to tell you guys something. Why are we doing this? Because I want to bring awareness to something and I hardly ever do this, which I need to tell you about a tour that I'm going on. And it's one of the endeavors that we're launching this year, which is I love doing workshops. I want to spend some time with you. Imagine doing this for eight hours with me with exercise, hands on things and where you can get feedback from myself 
and from the other people in the room. We'll do role plays. We'll do exercises. It'll be really fun and guaranteed you're going to get made fun of and laughed at and laugh with me and laugh at each other. And you're going to see a whole side of my personality you've never seen before. So if you're a creative, if you're an entrepreneur, you want to learn about creativity and business and build your personal brand, I'm going to encourage you to check out the link in the description below. It's all there for you. And hopefully I'll see you in person. Do we want to do the other half of this example yes, where it's do. like the consequences of not charging enough? So let's go there. Again, I'm going to throw <laughs> the ball in your court first, <laughs> my friend, and say, what are the benefits and consequences of charging less? So let's go with the benefits first. If you are able to charge less, what are the benefits of that? And do your best to try to be objective and neutral when you're describing this list. Again, I'm gonna prompt everybody to hit pause right now, to stop, make your own list, and then you can resume and compare and contrast what we say. Benefits, there may be more demand for you because you're more accessible to a bigger group of customers. It could not require as much resource, so the cost for it is going to be less, but that's out of necessity. Maybe it's faster in certain cases. So th that's what's coming to mind for benefits, and I'm trying here. <laughs> <laughs> what are the benefits of charging less? Well, when you charge less, it means you open up the potential customer base to more people. So you're going to get a greater variety of clients and you're going to get a greater volume of clients. You've removed a lot of the resistance in the buy sell cycle because you've priced it so low now that it doesn't even hurt me to try. And this is like akin to say fast fashion where you're not sure about that trendy shirt or tie. And so it only costs 25 bucks. So it's like, who cares? If it doesn't work, I throw it away. Whereas if you pay $3,000 for something, it better work because you are now living with that and you're going to beat yourself up. So it also means you attract a buyer who's not wholly committed, who's willing to try stuff, and it gives you a great variety of projects to work on. And maybe instead of having three clients, you're going to have 36 clients and you can show all these potential projects that you work on and you might get a lot more experience. And so by increasing the volume, let's say you can sell logos for $100. If you do 30 logos, it looks like a really big number. So in order to fulfill all these things, now we slip into potentially some of the consequences here. Well, who can afford to do this work? Well, I can't hire subcontractors because there's not enough budget in there for me to hire someone. If I hire someone, they might even charge more than what I charge. So I can do all the work myself, but because I have increased volume and increased opportunity, I have less time. So I have less attention and focus to each client and each problem. And I'm not spending all my nights thinking about this because my mind is racing with what I have to do the next day and the day after that. And so now, as a consequence, I'm going to work longer hours for more clients. I'm going to be switching gears pretty often. I may or may not make mistakes because I just don't have the time to sit there and refine and double check anything. I'll most likely be doing all the work myself. So that's awesome. So no subcontracted work. And some people love that. My hands are in the work, but it means I can get no help. And should I get sick? If I should have creative roadblock, I am screwed. And I'm not going to be able to give good customer service because I can't remember customers' names. It's the assembly line. We've become the McDonald's of fill in the blank of whatever service you provide. And very few people want to describe what they do as a parallel or an analog to fast food. We want to be fine dining, not fast food. So now I'm overwhelmed. I'm trying to make money to make things work. And, and you know, you can only go this hard for this long before you're completely burnt out. We have nothing left in the tank because you know why? Because you can't take vacation. You can't even go to the toilet because you're worried about the 13 other projects you've taken on. Talk so, your shit, Chris. <laughs> I mean, think about it. You're so That's right. That's the logic. I want to go all the way to the end of this thing. You might alienate your friends and your family and your loved ones because you're working all the time. They might label you appropriately as a workaholic, but you're saying, I'm just trying to provide. This is what's happening. The benefits are few. The consequences are many. So I want you all to think about that. So when you craft your irresistible offer and people want you to price your project lower, it takes a creative person with self-confidence and communication skills and business acumen to charge more. And that's a challenge. We want to do the things that are difficult because few people are willing to do the difficult things means I have less competition. This brings me to another point. The higher the price of what you do, the less competition you have because there are only a few people that charge that premium price. The lower the price that you charge, the more competition you invite. When you charge quite literally $100 for a logo, which is some people argue is too much for a logo to begin with. It means that Sally, who is a hobbyist designer, also charges $100 an hour. Jake, the student still in school and freshman design course is like, I'll do a logo front. So you're inviting a lot of competition. And at this point, you've educated your customer to buy based on price, not on value. Yes. To buy based on price, not on quality. So how can we do this? Because you're sitting there thinking, great, great <laughs> ideas, Chris. Just charge more. We've heard it. Blah, blah, blah. It's all you talk about, right? 
<laughs> that corporate American capitalist greed that you're always talking about. And I'll tell you this, friend, if this content doesn't sit well with you, doesn't resonate, just skip the video. But for everyone else who wants to know how to charge more, yet reduce friction, you're going to want to stick around for the rest of this. So here we go. What kinds of things do people feel that create tension and resistance to buying? How much risk is involved? Will this work out? Am I spending too much? Have you done this before? Do I know anyone that you've worked with that could vouch for you? This is risk. The higher the risk, the worse the offer is. So our main focus is to reduce risk. And we do this through many different things. We increase the perception or likelihood of success. And it's a perception, it's not real. Just if they believe it will work, that reduces buyer tension. So we need to assure them. And assurance is a fancy word for how do we guarantee them that this is gonna work? And I don't mean money back guarantees, even though that is a viable vehicle for an irresistible offer. I mean, guaranteeing that I have a track record, I'm published. I judge shows on the work that we do. I speak on stages. All these things help to assure the buyer and to reduce risk, perception of risk, increase the likelihood of success. Next, pain. What can you do to reduce the perception of pain when it comes to this project? Well, I have to manage this project, Chris. How many iterations will I see? How do I know this will work? Is this connected to my goals? So what you wanna do is simultaneously reduce the pain while you increase the perceived gains. And we can talk about it as Alex Hormozzi has written in his book, and I'll hold the book up here. If you like some of these concepts, I strongly encourage you to read this book because it's gonna go deep into this. It's called $100 million offers. I'm not affiliated with Alex at all. I make zero money by mentioning this, but what I wanna do is share resources and source material so that if you want a deeper dive, you will go here. The other thing that you wanna do is you wanna look at effort and sacrifices Alex writes about in his book, $100 million offers, which is how much effort do I have to do as the buyer and what will I have to give up sacrifice as the buyer? So if you take this to its logical conclusion, it should sound like easy, instant. You don't have to do anything. Results are near instant. As close as you can get that to design your offer, the more likely it is that you have an irresistible offer. So let's break this down and give some examples, okay? I I know one of the things among the many things that you do is you create video content for social consumption to help authors, thought leaders, and business people to grow their presence online. Yes. So let's try to imagine for a minute, I'm a buyer of that. I'm an author or a thought leader. What are the potential things that I have to do in terms of effort and sacrifice? So we want to reduce both effort and sacrifice because more effort and greater sacrifice means lamer offer. What can you take off the table to reduce my effort? So coming up with the ideas, topic ideas, editing the videos, you definitely don't have to do that, nor well, should we, you. Pre we presume. Posting, scheduling, monitoring the content across so Social. This is probably the hardest, but I'll say it because I know you're trying to just get it out of me. Filming. If we can minimize the time or the process or the effort involved in them filming, then it's a more appealing offer for sure. Now, in order to work with you and share whatever number you want, it could be real, it could be imaginary, it doesn't matter. But for the sake of the exercise, we'll go through this, okay? Now, in order to do this currently... How much might you charge someone per month to do this? Because it's an ongoing need. Go 5,000. Now let's stretch your imagination a little bit. Let's say you were given a crazy amount of money. We will say 10X. If someone to, were to pay you, a prospect to pay you $50,000 a month, first of all, I'm sure you'd be really happy. What else could you do to reduce effort and sacrifice? They would probably have a dedicated team for each of those components to where all they literally have to do is show up at a specific time out of their air conditioned trailer and then just perform. Literally, they all they would have to be is talent. Keep stretching, Mo. This is where you have to put on your creative cap, okay? This is where most creative people excel because most creative people are divergent thinkers that can pull from different areas and they can bring them in. Th thanks for that. Most creative people excel. Me over here struggling. Uh, no, not yet because we, we have to do is we have to grease the wheels. And once you start to see where I'm heading, the ideas will flow. So like many things, the dam pushes through a lot of silt and mud and it's a sludge that comes flying out of dams and they open it up again once it works through that and then it flows like crazy you help me out here a little bit give me no i want you to suffer for a little bit so people can see this in real time <laughs> okay you better not cut suffer. this part out no i'm not so you see this is a very helpful exercise right yeah yeah. You want to 10x the rep budget. And we just went through this whole exercise, like what you can do if you were paid more money. We just did this. So you can just map back to that. I see your eyes darting all over the place. You can just map back to that. Oh yeah, yeah, I remember we could do what? As it relates to creating 
social content for thought leaders. I mean, $50,000 a month, they would have a film crew that's on them 24 hours a day that can just be filming every waking moment of their day. There's an HBO series that they produce every time there's a big fight. Do you know what it's called? No, what it's called? What's it called? I think it's called 24 seven. And it's so successful for getting people to care that then they start to make this as part of their package. Basically, if there's a fight, they'll do 24 seven. And the theory is they shoot for about a week leading into the fight. So you kind of know what's going on. So you see how they're cutting weight. You see if they're in the gym. So you could offer your prospects 24 seven. Okay, what else? See, the wheels are starting to move now. So one thing I'll tell all of you who are listening or watching this is the first thing that people do is they say, when I give in 10 times more money, I just do 10 times more of the same thing. <laughs> That's pretty natural. What we gotta do is work through that. And there are ideas here that you're not even thinking of that have nothing to do with what you do today. I'm thinking about the product, maybe from a service standpoint. I'm 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 at a I'm at a block, man. Go yeah, I know, it. I know. I, I want you to be be in pain for a little bit. It'll make the reveal much better. So this person is theoretically, just as a concept, going to pay you 12 times 50K. I believe that's $600,000 a year. Sometimes you need to look at it like that. What could you do with $600,000 a year? Now, this is not premeditated. I'm just gonna go of what you young kids refer to as off the dome. If you were to hire me, Mo, let's just say you're a billionaire millionaire and you really care about your social presence. I'm happy to take your money, I'm gonna help you. The first thing I do is I would buy all the equipment that you need and set up a studio in your home. Lighting, audio, everything works all the time. I would actually set you up with a desktop. So literally you push one button on an app and everything turns on and I, gone in to set three presets for morning, day, and night. Whatever it is, you're good to go. Uh, let's say I create a ghost channel that only a few people see where I actually write concepts using AI and my team of copywriters and we use sampled audio from you to produce audio and video and we put it out there for a period of 24 hours to test to see if the concepts work. So I'm going to do a bunch of A-B testing concepts so I waste none of your time. So we're kind of saying these are bangers before you even record a single thing. I'm just getting started, Mo. You want me to stop? No, I don't. Actually, I want you to keep going. <laughs> so aside from the 24-7 crew, which we will send for very specific events, and we're going to think about the next time you do public speaking, they're going to follow you through your writing creative process. And then you're gonna document the whole journey from where you are to where you're going. BTS, fan reaction, we're gonna do that. So you can see how, and this is not meant to like say anything about you or anybody else. I've done this exercise before, obviously, not for this specific thing, but I say, I'm gonna give you 10 times as much money. And what people do is they do more of the same. But you can see like, once my mind is freed from this, after we push past, the sludge and the silt in the dam, we can get beautiful crystal clear water pushing through and sky's the limit. One of the concepts I picked up from one of the speakers at Neil's Ford Mastermind was this idea of vertical integration. And the presenter, I forget his name, I think it's Jeff, but what he said on stage was, what most people don't know is McDonald's is a very successful business, but they also have the largest potato farms and they have the largest chicken farms and they actually manufacture more toys than anybody and they sell zero toys. But what they've done is they've set up complementary businesses that support the main business that gives the main business an unfair competitive and legal advantage. The businesses, these vertically integrated businesses like the toy company makes no money doesn't need to make money, has no customers, but allows McDonald's to sell these Happy Meals for let's say 350 a Happy Meal. I need to update my prices here and include a toy that had they purchased somewhere else would have increased the price of the Happy Meal by a dollar or two, which then makes it too pricey to buy for your kids. That they take a wash on and they're able to do this. They can keep their prices at a certain place because they own the chicken farms. So what business owners do, very successful ones, is they can set up a vertically integrated business that doesn't need to make money, social media presence, personal brand building, and they could just lose money or break even on it because the amount of attention and publicity and PR that they get from that generate way more revenue for the other businesses. So when you understand this concept, you might approach your business offering in a very different light to attract a different kind of customer. So you can see this is really fun. When we get away from what we do and we get to play in this thought experiment in this fantasy land of what could we do if we got a lot of money and we broke free of our conservative thinking, we can come up with some pretty radical ideas. Wasn't that a fun exercise to do, Mo? Yeah, it's gonna make me replay this <laughs> alongside the team to just figure out certain things uh, to improve the business. So now we have potentially two services to sell to a client, which is one, what you do right now for 5K which sounded pretty good. One that we can sell to a different kind of client for 50K. So guess where we're going? We're gonna do the 10% rule now. We just tried 
10x, we go do 10%. So now if you only had $500 as a budget to help people with their social content, what could you do with that? Let's try to design some options. Go ahead, Mo. Still editing probably with a limited quantity of output. If you're already filming, so say that you are someone who maybe does podcasts or you do a lot of coaching calls, then we could repurpose existing footage to then edit. So the repurposing is a piece of it. And then schedule for you with a limited quantity of output for the month. You've done exactly what I wanted you to do. So this is brilliant. This is not meta. By the way, so everyone's watching. This is happening in real time. We did not prepare this. Like I'm actually sweating having this conversation. Show us with your it. pits. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so what a lot of people do is they assume this is scripted because it goes a certain way. And then I say, thank you that you thought it was that good that we scripted this whole thing. I'm just taking notes right now, just to show everybody hands in full transparency. I just have notes and I'm just writing down thoughts, right? So let's quickly recap. You had a $5,000 offer. We went bananas with the 10 X offer. And the first thing that you do is you just increase the amount of what you do to come up with your 10x offer. And what do you do in the reverse? When I say you have 10%, all you do is just reduce the quantity of what you're going to offer. Not a ton of innovative thinking there, Mo. You saw I'm what you did? such a great case study. Is, it, you did is this, this why we go perfectly. viral? <laughs> you did this perfectly. You really did. And if you are watching this in the audience, I know what you're doing. You're screaming at the screen, Mo, say this, say that. But here's the thing that you don't understand. When it's not you in the hot seat, your brain is really clear. You know how you watch like design competitions? I could do that. And they put you into design competition and you suck butt. <laughs> you totally suck, right? Why? Why? Why does that happen? Because adrenaline accelerated heart rate, perspiration, the idea that you're under uh, the spotlight and everybody's watching, it makes you second guess. So this is a pretty normal phenomenon. So we did the exact same thing. We just reduced the quantity and that's not the answer either. We must be innovative. And I think what happens is we have to fight the instinct to self-sabotage. When you hear 500 bucks, you're like, this sucks. I don't want to do this. So you'll generate ideas that suck, that express that you don't want to do this. And truth be told, how many videos can you edit for 500 bucks? How much content repurposing can you do? How much post-scheduling yeah. media management can you do? Nothing really. So you have to break the mold. We've heard of the concept of neural plasticity. I think neural relating to the brain and plasticity is how far it can stretch and mold. As we've learned, the older you get, the more rigid you become, the less neural plasticity you have. And there are ways that you can do this to remain an innovative thinker. They'll say simple things like take a different route home, to try to do something with your non-dominant hand, to walk backwards up the stairway because you're building new synaptic nerves in your brain Brain so it doesn't die on you. So thinking outside the box is not only good for your company, but it's also good for the preservation of these parts of your brain that you want to activate. So we know that there are constraints. It's very good to understand. Problem solving is understanding constraints and resources. So your constraint is $500. How can you make money in this modern world of $500? Well, depending on where you're from, let's assume that doesn't buy you very much. So the only way you can make money is to do it in volume, which is a constraint. And the only way I can do volume is I create something that is infinitely scalable. This should open up your thinking immediately. You know, for $500, I can write a pretty darn good guide. The Social Media Influencers Guide, How to Grow Your Social Following for Business Owners. And it includes uh, a pre-purchase coupon for a bunch of social media apps that you're gonna need. Still premium, not cutting any corners. It's just a different version of this. Mm. And some people are like, I love this. It comes with a deck of cards, not traditional cards, but each card is some prompt for you to think about, right? And it might even come with a brand guide on how to build your personal brand from a friend of yours, like Chris Doe, a killer guide to creating a personal <laughs> brand. Let's just say and you've included everything that you need for 500 bucks. So you're delivering tremendous value. These are things that you're like, now I'm thinking outside the box. What else can I do? This is where we kind of get unstuck and we start coming up with ideas. And, and actually now I'm going to ask you this and tell me honestly, you had your base idea. We told you a $50,000 thing. Did you get excited about the $50,000 potentiality of that? A little bit. Just yeah. a little bit. It would excite me a lot. Like, wow. If a client really gave me 50K and committed, I'd be so excited. I'm going to ask this question. Is time money? Is this a trick question? Yes and no. It depends on how much value you place on your time monetarily. That's my answer. I'm asking for a yes or no, and you're giving me a non-answer. Is time money? No. So I think it's a truth. Time is money, but not the way that you think. That's why I said it is and it isn't a trick question. Okay, everybody, is time money? Let's pause right now and write in the comments your answer. Is time money and say why? So you can say time is not money because, time is money because. That'll help us with the algorithm. I appreciate you. Let's get back into the episode. <laughs>
Time is money. Yes. This is why people charge hourly. Time is money. So my time is worth money. And they say, well, I should charge $50 an hour or $100 an hour. So they try to raise the price of what they charge hourly for. And this is what people like to argue with me when I say trading time for money is a fool's errand. And when you do that, you're punishing innovation. You're being punished for being good. Because when you sell units of time, you are incentivized to sell more time and not more results. No clients I know buy your time, they buy result. I don't really care if it took you 10 hours to fix a hole in the wall. In fact, actually, if you take too long, I'm kind of upset. So why am I saying this is true then? Because you know I don't believe in this. So people say, well, just keep changing your hourly rate, Chris. But conceptually, it's a flawed concept. It doesn't matter how much you scale it up or scale it down you're still exchanging time for money, which means the unit of measurement that is important is time and very few people buy your time. Okay, get ready. Here's the big twist roo on you, okay? Time is money, not your time, the client's time. Mm. That's the big flip on everybody. So your client's time, presumably, because they can hire you is worth more than your time. When you go in and you get your hair done by a stylist, whatever they charge you is worth less than what it would take for you to get a degree in, in beauty or hairstyling and for you to, be able to cut your own hair. It's just not worth it. So you just pay. Your time and effort is worth money. So the person who saves you your time and effort creates money for you. So when you're designing your irresistible offer, if you're feeling the pressure to reduce your price, do not reduce your price. Decrease the time in which you can deliver the desired outcome. Outcome. If nothing else, how do you think Amazon destroyed everybody? They got you your package in hand in a remarkable amount of time through a lot of logistics and programming and automation and optimization that no company can compete against. And the better they get at it, the harder it is for somebody to compete. Now, I love B&H and they're based in New York. When I order a camera, I want to order from B&H. They're good people. It takes a lot longer to get it from B&H because they don't have all the robots and inventory. Amazon looks into their system. They say our warehouse in Northern California already has it. In fact, we have one in LA. We can get it to you same day. Nuts. Nobody can do that. So Amazon has created customer loyalty, even though you might not think of it like that, but customer preference because they've been able to shorten the period in time in which it takes to get something. In some instances, I feel like it's more painful for me to get in my car, to drive somewhere, to buy it, to go back home versus hit one button. It'll be here so fast. So true. So think about how you can deliver your product faster, not deliver an inferior product, but to deliver the same product or the better product in less time. What can you do to reduce perceived risk and increase perception of success? There's a whole host of things you can do. And when you do that, you want to package all of this up. And now you have three tiered pricing. You have your $500 option. You have your $5,000 option and you have the Ritz Carlton option, four seasons, $50,000 white glove. I'll give you a back rub while you're at it. <laughs> And by providing pricing options, you've removed a necessity for the client to triple bid you. So to kind of land the plane here, Mo, is when we talk about writing an irresistible offer, it's not about packaging. It's literally redesigning from the ground up what your offer is so much so that your clients feel, in Alex's word, stupid for saying no. An offer so good, it sells itself. That's my time. My name is Chris, and thanks for coming to church. <laughs>